Yesterday, an independent FDA advisory panel voted in favor of authorizing the protein-based vaccine Novavax. And now, if authorized, Novavax would become the fourth COVID vaccine that is available in the U.S., being the first of its kind to be authorized in the states. Some experts are hopeful that Novavax might sway the remaining vaccine-hesitant populations in the U.S., given that it is protein-based, while the other three vaccines use the newer mRNA technology. Meanwhile, newly public CDC data shows over 80 million doses of the Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines have been wasted over the course of the pandemic. That's over 11 percent of the total doses ordered and distributed by the federal government. NBC reports that vaccine distributors blame declining demand, large minimum orders and multi-dose vials. Our rising panel joins us now to weigh in on these developments. Jordan Charrington is a journalist and CEO of Status Quo News. And Amy, Dar Amy Tarkanian is a Republican strategist and former chairwoman of the Nevada State GOP. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Hey. Amy, let's start with you. Do you think this is going to have an effect on COVID skeptical uh, populations who, for one reason or another, are not as fond of the idea of an mRNA vaccine as they might be of this new protein vaccine? I think it's going to be a mixed bag, actually, because that was the concern from the get go with some folks who were hesitant on the mRNA. They wanted your more traditional protein based vaccines like what we're used to. Uh, however, I think now that we have seen a number of health issues transpire due to the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines um, and uh, I, I don't think that it's going to actually have people knocking on their their doctor's doors, you know, waiting in long lines, eager to take this fourth possible vaccine. Uh, I did read a study where they said that the new one is they tested 40,000 people and of those 40,000, only five um, actually ended up with myocarditis. But with those five, I know that with Pfizer and Moderna alone, there were a number of folks, and I don't know what the exact number was, but they did end up with myocarditis and a, a number of other health concerns. Um, and I did have family and friends who unfortunately ended up with weak immune systems due to the, taking the vaccine that had the mRNA, or they even had a stroke or a heart attack. So I don't see this being the actual answer, unfortunately, to calm everyone's concerns. Jordan, what do you think? Uh, will uh, the rest of the vaccine hesitant uh, perhaps get in line now that this, uh, this one is available? Um, no, I don't think so, uh, for, for different reasons. I, I think that uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot, you know, excluding some communities that, you know, uh, particularly black communities uh, that, you know, were rightly skeptical based on their history with uh, government and, uh, you know, medical experiments. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the vaccines became part of the never ending culture war. Uh, I don't know how much of uh, the percentage of people that didn't want to take the vaccine was necessarily about the vaccine uh, rather than, you know, essentially you know, what they were being fed uh, in a lot of cases by right wing media. I also think there's a Trump element because there are reports that Trump is soon to announce his run for the presidency. And knowing Donald Trump, I could see Trump saying, well, that's not my vaccine uh, and cast doubt on it. Uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed uh, was Donald Trump with the mRNA vaccine. So uh, I think it's a mixture of a lot of things. I also think the element that the media is not really covering uh, COVID uh, as much anymore. Uh, those people who were already kind of, uh, you know, had held out. I don't really think that they would feel an urgency to go get the vaccine, uh, considering the media is not really covering COVID as a crisis anymore. And to what do you attribute that, Jordan? Because I know that some folks on the left have been arguing that because it's not a good issue for Joe Biden, regardless of what the crisis is actually doing right now, regardless of what rates actually are, there's been kind of like a, you know, see nothing, say nothing uh, attitude about COVID that was criticized under Donald Trump, which but which seems to have been adopted by the Biden administration. 
Yeah, it's it's bizarre. It seems like a few months ago. I don't know if they were on the same conference call, but the media just <laughs> their their narrative completely shifted to it's basically over. Uh, I think it's kind of the old adage: if it bleeds, it leads. So they would obviously cover it when you had three thousand people dying a day. Um, you know, refrigerator trucks with bodies uh, in those horrible days of 2020. Uh, but when it's you know less people dying um, and you know kind of. Uh, normalized, so to speak, that we have this many hospitalizations, this many cases. Um, I think they're less prone to cover it. I also think that's going to come back to bite us because contrary to what a lot of people are saying, I mean, there's a new study out uh, based on many countries, uh, 21 studies wrapped into this one study that a quarter of children that are getting COVID or having long COVID symptoms. So uh, in a couple of years, we might be looking back uh, at, at a new disability uh, issues. So I think the media is not covering it because less people are dying, which is a good thing. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of variants spreading, uh, each one more contagious than the other. Hmm. Well, switching gears just a bit, the CDC has again changed its monkeypox masking guidance, removing content from its website uh, that was listing mask wearing as a recommended precautionary measure for individuals travel, traveling to countries where monkeypox cases have been detected. So a CDC spokeswoman said the agency removed the advice because it caused confusion, but didn't respond immediately to the Wall Street Journal's request for more details. Uh, what do you make of this, Amy? It looks to me like, and I'm not specific, quite sure, but they had just a generic recommendation to wear masks to prevent, to watch out for monkeypox while you're traveling. And then I, I think after some uh, maybe possibly right leaning uh, uh, news outlets notice that and uh, well, do you really need to just kind of wear a mask generally to guard against monkeypox? It takes more. I, I think I believe the thinking is it takes more sustained contact and, and possibly um, uh, sexual contact is how it's been spread. I think it, it could spread more easily than that, but that's how it's been spreading uh, so far. And and then they just kind of quietly revised that guidance. Is, is that your read on, on what happened? Well, it's mixed messaging, that's for sure. And monkeypox is not a new illness. So I'm not sure why they're having a tough time giving the public the correct information. This is something that was found in 1970, and it's primarily from the central and western countries of Africa. So this is not new. The fact that they switched from this is low, uh, a low risk to the general public, then to a level two alert, then from, hey, you need to wear a mask, then now to uh, no, now you don't need to wear a mask. I mean, where where are the professionals? Where are the actual scientists on this? So I, I find it a little concerning that they're having a tough time giving us the basics on an illness that's not new. So my understanding after just reading a little bit of coverage is that monkeypox can be spread via, you know, you know a, a kind of aerosol, at least, you know, spit spray landing on you, mm -hmm. but is most commonly spread with skin to skin contact, specifically uh, contact of a sexual nature. But, you know, I wonder if the fact that so many people are generally masking for COVID has led people to say, well, this isn't some, the kind of recommendation I would make for any given illness. I mean, obviously, if you mask, it will help keep you from getting the flu and any number of other things, but we haven't done that in the, in the past because we didn't think there was that level of urgency. Go ahead and throw a mask on because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a catch-all and people then realize the political implications of doing so given that masks have been so heavily politicized. Jordan, what do you make of this? Do you, do, what do you make of the fact that monkeypox seems to be kind of growing in coverage and attend, media attention despite a altogether pretty low number of cases just as COVID is kind of leaving the headlines? Yeah, I don't really put a lot of stock in what the Capitalist Defense Center uh, says anymore. I mean, the CDC. Uh, I, I think it's uh, pretty, pretty obvious uh, that they uh, basically toss out conflicting, contradictory statements on the regular uh, based on which business interests or, you know, political special interests are pressuring them. Uh, with monkeypox, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I, the reading I've done, you know, it mirrors smallpox, which uh, smallpox in uh, in some cases did actually spread. Uh, airborne. Uh, but, you know, that wasn't uh, the majority of the spread. So I think there's still, uh, like the other guests said, there's a lot known about monkeypox, uh, but we also don't really know, you know, how how close do you have to be to someone for it to spread in, in the case of aerosols? Uh, and, you know, 
for the most part, it seems it is spread uh, through surface. And uh, as some reporting has said, uh, you know, through uh, same same sex interactions. So uh, I'm not an expert on it, but I would say that it's hard to actually have a concise understanding among the public when the CDC on many things uh, has been a big bowl of confusion. Hmm. Yes, it has. Well, Jordan, Amy, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank Thank you. you. And we'll have more rising right after this.